Yeah, my, my session is about uh, SMB to data center. So my idea is I want to switch gears against, against when Yaromir did the technical deep dive. Uh, I'm more about a bit less technical this this time. I just want to speak from the field of what, what we encountered, what installations we have, and what we, you can do with Azure Stack HCI in, in general. Uh, to, yeah, just it's a great product. It's uh, it's a tremendous product, and I often think that not enough people know what they want to do and what what's going on there. So, this, does everybody see my slides at the moment, or is uh, I'm, I'm still on video? It would be great to see the slides, Manfred. Both Helmut, uh, you the slides are uh, in full size and a small video besides. Okay, great. It, it's enough if they see the slides, though. So if you turn off the video, turn off the video, it's better, because okay. some pictures on the slides are already diminished, and then it gets really small. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my to my person, so the click is not working. No. My person, I'm Helmut Otto. I'm a managing director of SecureGuard, MVP for cloud and data center. Uh, my main profession is uh, at the moment, or my company's main profession are two things. We do, uh, we write software for uh, aircraft and commercial airplanes, build uh, some portable servers for them. And our other hobby is that we certify Azure Stack HCI uh, hardware, especially for uh, German customers and uh, German resellers. And uh, in case of that, we see a whole lot of different configurations. And that's why I want to speak a bit about yeah, the emerging of that, what you can do it and what we see and configuration and customers and ideas, which customers have how to use Azure Stack HCI in different environments. Uh, just a short introduction, we go from le legacy uh, infrastructure now to hyper-converged infrastructure that was the big step with uh, S2D and now the biggest step with Azure Stack HCI. We scale it from two nodes up to 16 nodes, even when Carsten and some others and like me don't want to see 16 node clusters in general. Uh, we start up with four disks and we can go to four petabyte of capacity. We can have scalability between uh, 10 to 400 gigabit Ethernet networking. So it's a real scalable, great product. And on including all that, you also have the possibility to run it in a hybrid environment so that you have a centralized management out of Azure, that everything you get additional services out of, of Azure and can integrate it easily into a hybrid uh, infrastructure, which gives you a, a much better performance than if you have it on premise on, only. And it's scalable up to a whole number of use cases where we want to go through now. So we're based on Intel or AMD processors up to 2000. 48 logical processors from 32 gig to 48 terabyte of RAM, 400 terabyte per node, 4 petabyte per cluster of storage. As I said, 10 to 400 gigabit Ethernet. Uh, Windows Server 2019-2022 with S2D or Azure Stack HCI 2H2 and 21H2 are at the moment uh, the versions we are working with and we are certifying for. Uh, and then we come to the different use cases, but before I want to have some words about uh, certification and why it's so, so essential to only use uh, validated nodes or integrated solutions so that you use certified uh, environments like you've seen in the slide here, there's a whole scalability, but one of the essential things that your cluster is really, really running well and really running good is that somebody takes care that all of these camp components work together, not only work together, also were tested together and were certified together. So with all the sponsors here, like Dell and Lenovo, they really 
do a great job in certifying their uh, uh, apply uh, their hardware so that you as customer at the customer has a good experience and all of the use cases we speak about are now uh, really possible from that. And it's not only uh, Dell and Lenovo, it's also a great number of other uh, suppliers, uh, especially also in German speaking Europe, where we have a whole lot of uh, smaller companies offering uh, validated nodes for Azure Stack HCI. Now from the use case perspective, the one use case or the use case which we see as uh, Uh, which we see um, most in our environment at the moment for Azure Stack HCI is the two cluster, the two node cluster. So that the two node cluster is uh, especially interesting in rather small environments. So you have few VMs, few users, you are in a low budget and high availability is still required. Uh, from a hardware perspective, you can run such a two node uh, um, cluster on a normal desktop micro cluster like they are offered or on a really uh, small environment with only uh, four storage disks. And the, the different use cases we see here, are especially uh, branch offices, uh, of bigger environments. That's interesting because you have a centralized pane of glass for all of your branch offices. E each of your branch offices has a, the possibility uh, with uh, rolling updates, uh, with clusterware updates that you have no downtimes in the branch offices. You have the same security and the same uh, availability in the branch office as you have it in the uh, in your main office or in your uh, in your center office or your data center. Uh, a special form of branch offices we see is retail store. And what we also see is an, uh, that uh, two node clusters are often used by ISVs as a rollout option for business software. So for uh, ERP software or for accounting software so often. The, the, the point it's at the moment with Azure Stack HCI is not often we, we see it, but it's not the, the main uh, environment where we see it. So at the moment, if we compare uh, HCI rollouts to um, normal Windows Server rollouts, I think we are in a sort of a three to one split or four to one split. So about between 20% to 25% of certified uh, hardware installations are really on Azure Stack HCI. The rest is still on uh, Microsoft Server 2016 to 2019. And uh, um, the uh, use case here is you don't have too much VMs but you still want the high availability. The interesting thing is what we see in our own home market in Austria at the moment that we see more and more really small business uh, companies, uh, which are um, five to 20 user companies also using uh, Azure Stake HCI as their main installation point for their hardware, for the servers, and also for their uh, digital transformation to go to go more to Azure, bring services out to Azure in a hybrid environment. And when we look at, at this scenario, it's interesting in a way because it's uh, it really brings also uh, commercial advantages to the smaller ones. Since Azure's HCI in the meantime is based on, on a per core licensing, uh, the for the small company who doesn't need too much licenses, it's much cheaper than running a big single shot Windows Server with data center and things like that. So the, the smallest installations we have at, or we see at the moment are based on 
this microcluster there. In that case, it's a, a Thomas Grand machine. It's already certified. Uh, it's based on a four core AMD EPIC processor. And the, the two node installation, including storage and everything is well below 10,000 euros. So which makes it uh, extremely affordable uh, uh, for everybody, even in a in a smaller environment, and the yeah, say let's say the evolution of this whole thing is the next what we build. It was more or less built because it was uh, yeah, I was forced to do it. It was a project over winter from 2019 to 2020 uh, because one of the Microsoft guys, Cosmos Darwin uh, on Ignite 2019 in autumn 2019 was always on stage uh, with uh, um, a half size one U server from another vendor telling yeah, that's how small and how flexible uh, Azure Stack HCI and S2D can get. And when we met at the end of the show, I promised him when I will see you again, you will get a box which you can put on stage, take with you like a briefcase, and it won't be only something which you can show. It will be a full running cluster, including everything and infrastructure in a single box. And uh, Result of this whole thing was the cluster in a wooden box, which is a full flash dual node four core uh, four core uh, Azure Stack HCI certified uh, cluster, including uh, uh, a ten gigabit switch for the storage networking and a one gigabit switch with an access point uh, for consuming the VMs on there and uh, that you that you can run it on uh, on the stage it has an integrated battery pack with uh, 200 watt hours of lithium ion batteries which gives you around the runtime of two and a half hours uh, without any uh, additional uh, tc power supply so at the end of the day it's a usb uh, 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 backup uh, server which can run in an edge scenario and just to be total open uh, we've built these servers already for an edge scenario uh, not in a wooden box then but then in a uh, uh, in a metal case uh, so that they uh, that they can run uh, on uh, cars or vehicles and can gather data uh, on the outside uh, at uh, uh, plants, buildings, uh, construction sites and things there. And uh, the idea also is uh, the integrated uh, uninterruptible power supply UPS makes it also suitable for environments where the whole uh, the whole thing is a bit rougher. And yeah, and that's the that's the reason why it wasn't only a let's say a hobby at the end, but it led to a full qualified product. And also, if somebody wants uh, uh, that uh, wants something like that, uh, just contact me. We can do it with every logo because the whole wood is uh, laser cut and we can change it and it's it's a nice little gimmick if you want to go to a customer displaying Azure Stake HCI and uh, yeah and it's based on certified hardware as I said before so it's says so the next use case we want to speak about and what we see as the let's say uh, most common most often found installation at at our edge is uh, a four node cluster so most of our customers at the moment deploy uh, azure stack hci or s2d on four node cluster many of them since uh, 2016 uh, like carsten already mentioned in a form that they stretch two nodes in two different fire zones the interesting thing here is you 
get high performance and high bandwidth. Uh, and you should have, have low latency between the nodes, but it's normally and if they are directly connected. And uh, in the enterprise, uh, we see this in uh, totally different use cases. Uh, one of the bigger customers we have uses it in uh, database and data mining. It's an interesting use case because uh, we have a whole lot of cores used by, by SQL Server and not too much VMs on these machines. Uh, um, but then the most common uh, installation we see there, and that's the most, uh, yeah, that's where the customers get most out of the advantages uh, of uh, Azure Stake HCI and the S2D environment uh, is uh, in a default company having a mixed environment with some active directory, for instance, still some exchange servers, some databases, uh, line of business applications, uh, things like that. Uh, a whole, not a whole lot of a big working set normally, because if you look at the databases or if you look at the exchange servers, what we encountered on customer sites when we do installation or when we support installation for our partners, uh, we see that the working sets are well below 10% of the whole storage there. Uh, in a normal environment, it's not only below 10%. We see the working sets of all the storage, which are really changed per day is, is just around two to 3%. Uh, the application workload is uh, high in the beginning of the day when everybody logs on, but it uh, doesn't show uh, some special forms. And what we see there in most of the, uh, installation also is the possibility to use uh, tiered storage there. Uh, that means that you have uh, fast storage, NVMEs for cache, uh, SSDs for your working set, and then uh, really HDDs down there for uh, cold data, which isn't that often used. So if you look into a typical exchange server, I think the hot data of an exchange server is well below normally 1% because you have uh, data mails from several years, but uh, you only get, you only work with the uh, mails or the data from the last two days. And then uh, tiered storage is the best possibility there that you really save and to get the best price performance uh, um, uh, out of your installation. Then uh, what we see also is what Carsten was thinking or was telling that the stretch caster environment with the redundancy between fire stretched between rooms, buildings. Uh, we have one customer which even stretches this cluster, his cluster between two, three tier data centers over around 100 kilometers with dark fiber between the data centers. Um, and in this environment, we also see uh, already then uh, um, not only the normal commercial 3D installations, but what, what we see here also is that uh, customers use, um, <clears throat> uh, let's say some sort of uh, edge forms of installations. So either things like uh, high storage capacity for backup solutions. Uh, we have one customer which is an, in, oh, we know a customer, we sub, it's not our customer, it's a customer of our customers. It's an insurance surveyor. Uh, he has the interesting use case that his guys, his agents are going out, taking pictures of insurance cases, filling up multiple, sometimes SD cards, came back, into the uh, office, load all of these SD cards up to the file server. And then from the uh, sometimes thousands of pictures, take two or three to make the reports. But all of the rest of the pictures are archived with the case. So in this case, in that uh, environment, we really have a corner case 
it's one of the clusters we discussed before everything got live. It's a 12 node cluster, which uh, Carsten won't recommend. And for sure, it's not really a, a total yeah, common scenario because still in a 12 node cluster, you only have the possibility that new two nodes fails. That's third failure will at the end of the day in a way shut down the cluster if you don't go in special configurations uh, with your volumes and things like that but on the other side we there we have the the problem that we want to have uh, an extreme amount of storage with an extreme low working set because the working set of this installation they have to keep the data for seven years uh, for some legal reasons, especially they're doing medical cases, and so they have to keep it on prem. Uh, so, and the working set is below 0.1% of the data. So, what we did here, we, we made a tiered storage, we built a tiered storage, and we pushed 36. A, HDDs with 12 terabytes into each of these 12 nodes for for, for storage and re really at the moment then begin scratching at the at the high level of uh, uh, oh yeah 400 terabyte regions which we can address in on, in only one node and then also on the better byte ranges of the whole cluster but at the end of the day for this customer, it's still the cheapest and best solution and thankful to a customer, to one of our partners, it was made available in that way. Um, yeah, and then the total high end. Uh, sorry. Yeah, total high end. Uh, Thing where we have data centers, uh, we have a th tier three data center where an MSP uses not Azure Stack HDI but S2D on Windows Server in that case to provide services to his customers. Uh, there, the maximum hardware configurations are things he's considering, like 2048 vCPUs for their RAMs. And at the moment, uh, evaluating uh, 200 gigabit of networking, not 400, and uh, also having nodes where the maximum amount of v they are reaching the maximum amount of 2,000 uh, VMs in an environment. Uh, I've, re I've written or I've talked here about eight to 16 node clusters. The, the idea is the biggest possible cluster is 60 node, but in clusters which uh, has really uh, high load, which are really highly redundant and which you want to work with. I think all of us, including Manfred and Carsten, we think that the highest number of nodes you should do if you're not in a special edge configuration is eight. Again, what I've discussed before, because you are in the case that you have fault domains and in your fault domain, only two nodes can fall down before the cluster falls. The metadata is only brought up on five nodes in general. So um, everything is fine there if you run it with eight nodes and you have additional possibilities like this customer is using where you do cluster sets so that you can easily migrate VMs between different clusters. You can go uh, between uh, different clusters with the normal tools and yeah, it gives you more reliability, more uh, availability of the whole thing if you run it with uh, lower nodes and if you want to stretch the clusters, it's still a 4-4 configuration on two sides with stretch cluster and uh, uh, yeah, it's always a, a also a commercial point. The, the more node uh, you have in the cluster, um, the better the price performance ratio will be. On, on the other hand, uh, on the other hand, uh, the more nodes you have a cluster, the more you suffer if you lose two nodes, and the, the more likely it is that you lose two nodes because it's 50%, uh, it's 100% more likely to 
lose two nodes in a 16 node cluster than it is in an eight node cluster. Yeah, that was just the first part of my speech about uh, the different use cases. And then I want to go over to the hybrid architecture in Azure Stack HCI so that one of the main features why customers think about these use cases, why they go for Azure Stack HCI or for uh, uh, S2D and Windows services is the hybrid uh, um, idea Microsoft has. We can have an on-prem part included into a cloud part. We can easily migrate to the cloud part, but in, in between, I want to see if there are some questions. Um, yes, they are. Yeah, okay. Um, just wait, I was just tweeting about uh, <laughs> about your presentation. Uh, where's my Teams? Here it is. So we had some questions from the audience. Um, Here it is, the right one. Where? I go to the window. I have, I have multiple this Teams sessions. There it yeah. is. Okay, thank you. Um, one is asking about uh, Azure Stack Edge. Uh, and, uh, they have a POC with uh, Microsoft hardware, you, the usual one you can only lease, but yeah. is there, are there also other options you maybe, uh, maybe um, refer to? So if they want to do Azure, Azure Stack Edge, so the, uh, I think the IoT deployment. Uh, the, I know the you really do something there. We, we do something there. The real Azure Stack Edge is all for Microsoft only, uh, but we also had project also, or we have POCs including with, uh, with Microsoft since Azure Stack Edge is not available in all regions, for instance also, uh, is that you can do uh, IoT on Azure Stack HCI. We have proof of concepts with Azure Stack IoT on HCI, especially when we look at the, at the small two node clusters or if this uh, at the idea like the, the cluster in a wooden box, in that case, the cluster in a metal case then, uh, where this, <laughs> this gives you the possibility to run your IoT edge part there you have the idea uh, you have the possibility to add uh, gpus to these clusters or uh, do really good data mining because even if it's only a four core cluster with 10 gig networking uh, it can be full flash and it makes around 100,000 iops which is not bad for any hardware in the region of 5k for a cluster and uh, it is normally enough to uh, gather all the data on a construction site or somewhere somewhere there. So yeah, you have you have two possibilities there. You can make a small cluster uh, going full flash or going normally with a GPU card. Why it's an either or is that the small clusters are normally based on mini AD exports and you only have one PCIe slot. And you use either the PCIe slot for the NVMEs full flash or you use it for the GPU card. GPU card. Okay. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, there's another one. Um, uh, another question about interconnect setup. Are you interconnecting even more than two nodes so without using extra switches for storage replication traffic and are you choosing rocky or iowa which one you prefer i have also an opinion about that but uh, the audience asks you the the point is uh i'm not uh, really a friend of direct connections so uh, even in, in my nodes. also not in two nodes uh, even in the glass in the wooden box, there is a 10 gig switch in there. There's a four board 10 gig switch in there for the storage network. It's a cheap one, to be honest. So the, it's around 100 euros, uh, but it saves you a whole lot of problems when it comes down to uh, you're losing one cluster node. If you have a switch, the other cluster node knows that you loses the network connection to this node and knows that his own network interface is still fine. Mm -hmm. if, if you have it uh, on a crossover cable, 
OneNote thinks one of my network interfaces has a problem because it's going down. And you can more and more into problems where you, the cloud witness or a files, file share witness has to be used to get which one of the two, two nodes is really the healthy one. And we know some situations now at, at the meantime at our customers, especially with 2019, where both nodes think they lost their witness, they're down, and they begin rebooting. So uh, I'm no friend of this uh, crossover installations. Uh, in some cases, it's fine because it's you have uh, environments where it has to be that way. You don't have the, the possibility for a switch or so, but if you can afford it, just put a switch in. It's not a high, or, high or end. Two. Or two. Or two. Yeah. yeah. Because At the if end. the switch fails, you have the same problems, right? Yeah, if the switch fails, you have the same problems, but you're, then you're down anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not down by accident and because of a, of a misleading witness uh, vote, but you're down anyway because one of your core component fails. But uh, switches are not that expensive, especially there. And um, just to be honest, when it comes between iWarp and Rocky, I personally prefer Rocky. Uh, it's not hard to configure from my opinion. It's not everybody's opinion, but my opinion is it's not hard to configure. We started our biggest and, and high end as in installations where, where, where we do multiple million IOPS with Mellanox cards on Mellanox switches. And that's so not it's hard to configure with you. <laughs> so that's, that's per uh, a perfect setup. <laughs> yeah, uh, but on the other side, when we come down to this two node cluster and to this really small clusters and it, we come down to the uh, to the socks we have available at the moment. One of the really good socks we can use there is the Skylake DE uh, from Intel, which you have from two core up to 16 cores and it has an inter integrated uh, X55 uh, 551 uh, card in there and this card does iWarp. And Helmut, your camera is uh, going up and up and uh, up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We just saw only your, your glasses up, so uh, thank you. Sorry. So sorry. I have another great question, but I will ask it after this part of the presentation because uh, it's it's a question we I think there is more discussing ground for all of us around. So please continue your presentation and after that we have a question that can maybe take a while to answer. Okay, so I will speak for the rest or what? <laughs> if you need yeah. that, that's okay too. <laughs> no, so yeah, uh, the second part will go with uh, Windows Admin Center UI and what uh, possibilities and services I have uh, in this environment uh, and to the hybrid architecture we have with Azure Stack HCI OS. We see we have validated par partner hardware on this. We have at least uh, the three main uh, services Azure Stack HCI OS as an infrastructure provider has, which means I have compute in Hyper-V, I have uh, storage spaces direct, which gives me storage like the name says, and I have uh, software defined networking for my network uh, for this. On that only, on that, I can, and on this on-premises Hyper-V, then I can run Windows Server. Oh, what a surprise. I can run Linux, which we see more and more often, and I have the possibility to run Kubernetes services on that, especially Azure, Azure Kubernetes services. Then I go and administer the whole thing with Windows Admin Center, but like Manfred and you also said, not only normally, you have also PowerShell and some line of uh, some uh, legacy tools to get all out of the clusters, and then you connect to the Azure services. And I want to speak a bit about the different Azure services which are available and which we see on customer sites and which are really used by customers, or which are also used in proof of concepts or, or yeah tests at the moment. So the first Azure service you have to use with Azure Stake HCI is the Azure Stake HCI registration. As we know, licensing in the meantime is per core. Your clusters should at least uh, connect one month, one time a month to the uh, to uh, Azure to get a new license. Uh, not connecting to Azure won't shut down any virtual machines, but uh, will 
kill all your possibilities to administer virtual machines. So you won't see a breakdown in productivity and in what you're doing at the moment. But if you don't have a, a connectivity for more than 30 days, you won't be able uh, to reconfigure virtual machines, bring up new virtual machines, delete old ones and so on. So you're just running in the environment you have. Uh, to be honest, that's really working. So we disconnected a small do not cluster for 30 days from the internet and then we saw this behavior, it's implemented. So it's nothing which is just sad, it's in a way you get problems after 30 days with no connectivity to Azure. Uh, that And if you connect again, no problem, everything is working fine just on the minute. So the license is redone. Uh, then we have an, the, let's say optional Azure services you can use, especially uh, the site recovery, backup, update management, file sync, monitor, the security center, and all of that managed from one centralized management on your uh, on-prem installation from Windows Admin Center, which is in that case an edge local ad management, so you have it at your own. You have the whole set of applications then containers, cognitive services, Azure Kubernetes services, all, all on that, which is then their hybrid. And if you want to integrate all of your, or your resources you have on Azure Stack HCI into the Azure portal and bring it as a resource to the Azure, Azure portal, you can use Azure Arc and integrate your VMs with Azure Arc, uh, something where we will hear more from in Thomas's talk, hopefully, at the end. So, how are these services uh, presented into uh, in Windows Admin Center? In Windows Admin Center, there is a whole section which says Azure Hybrid Center. In this Azure Hybrid Center, you have the access to all of these hybrid services. You can bring them up there, you can set it up there, you can integrate your cluster into this. Uh, it's not always the cluster, it's also the possibility that you integrate your single machine into it. So Azure Arc is normally only single machine integration. And uh, you see the same services again, when you go to this uh, Windows Admin Center hybrid, you have the Azure Arc, that's a recommendation, it's free, so just do it. And then you have the, the different services uh, with backup, file sync, we will go through the services in detail. What is uh, backup, Windows Azure backup can be used in two forms, either directly, so you can backup Windows files and folders directly to Azure, restore them directly to Azure, use it native. The, second form which is available you can go via third, third party backup uh, like vm or so or convolts in bana or uh, other third parties which then back it up in azure in a blob and you restore it can restore out of the blob but uh, just to be honest uh, with uh, carsten and uh, dda there so if you if somebody has uh, questions about vm and backing up uh, there are specialists already in the speaking about it. Uh, yeah, uh, we have some vanguards in the speaker list also. The next thing is if you don't want to back up, so, but you want to have uh, only files synced, you can have a centralized retention of files on Azure. Then files are locally cached. And the interesting thing here is you have multi-site access. So you can have multiple sites uh, attached to these uh, files and the changes made to one site will be synced over other sites in uh, all other offices. Uh, please be aware that's not real time. It's not a stretch cluster or something like that. So if you do changes on one side and you, if you do a whole lot of changes in multiple files on one side and somebody else is working on another side with the same set of files, you tend to get problems. Uh, 
how the whole thing can be synced again. Uh, so you will get multiple version of the same file and somebody has to do his uh, decision how you uh, reintegrate the data, the different data to this file. Uh, if um, someone already worked with a shared OneNote, for instance, then for sure they will have this uh, feature set where you have multiple version outs from the same file where then where you then have to do uh, some conflict resolution to get to a correct version again. So it's a great possibility. It's a great possibility if uh, mainly if you have a whole lot of consumers and normally only one producer. So if you want to have it local on different sites, but it, the, the producing side is only one. And it's a great possibility like we use it in some customers where their production sites are in countries where the, let's say, the data connectivity is normally not too good. So like one of our customers uh, has uh, servers in a uh, place called 103D, which is nothing else than an oil field in the middle of the Sahara uh, with a satellite link. And for them, that, that's a great possibility to get files there and work with the files and not run in blobs, uh, sync single files and get it as fast as a file is available there. Then we have uh, Azure Site Recovery. Azure Site Recovery uh, gives you the possibility to back up local VMs to Azure and fail start this F, uh, this uh, VMs in Azure and fail over to this whole thing. Please be aware that's a great concept, but you will have some network problems because you fail over to a different network in Azure. So your server has to run with a different IP address and also it gives there's no possibility that you fail over your, for instance, your DHCP server. It, won't, it will be of no use if your DHCP server runs in Azure. It, you won't get DHCP addresses out of it because DHCP is a broadcast and it won't go over routed networks. So be aware that's a great possibility, but uh, sometimes you need to have some scripts if the failover uh, starts so that the whole uh, infrastructure and configuration is still is smoothly running. The, how to extend your on-premises network to uh, Azure, then it's the Azure Network Adapter. So if you want to start this uh, machine in Azure, you have to extend your network to, to Azure at the end of the day, and you need this Azure Network Adapter for uh, accessing then the resources in uh, there. One of the additional points is Azure Update Management, so you can update all of your machines either in Azure or local, either if it's uh, Windows or Linux, or so it's yum apt or whatever you use there. Uh, th the system is relatively simple. You have a uh, run books. So you have a pre steps where you check if updates are necessary, if updates are can be applied, then the updates are run, and then in a, in, a, in, the, the, in the next step, reports are generated, and you see how these updates were rolled out, and if everybody's fine, and how many of your servers accepted the updates, and what what went wrong. Hopefully, nothing went wrong, and 100% of the servers have the update. But the bigger the installations are, the less likely you have no problems. So that's the whole thing, and that all you see in a really simple uh, uh, dashboard that is, it gives you an overview of this whole thing. Coming soon, it's a bit of a preview. Or is it already released? Do you know, Carsten? I don't know either. Three weeks ago it was know. coming soon, but it, uh, just I have to admit, I hadn't checked it in the last three weeks if it's already released. Uh, it's uh, the possibility to use the monitor security configuration and telemetry on premise uh, and uh, leverage security center and Azure Sentinel also for Azure Stack HCI and on premise or all other clouds. 
but the, for us it's really essential that we have the on-premise uh, whole Azure Stack family on-premise, which means Hub and HCI, where we can report data to Azure Security cent uh, Center and uh, at, to the SIM Azure Sentinel uh, to get, uh, uh, let's say, single single look on my security environment and what's happening and use the same features which also think was one of the questions uh, how can we uh, prevent uh, ransomware attacks and things like that so like dave said install security and when it's coming please integrate the whole thing to the security center so that you have a single point where you can get uh, an idea about the health of your system and the especially the health of the security of your system same what's coming soon is the azure extended network which extends a local subnet to net uh, Azure, so it means you don't have to change IP addresses any longer. You have 250 address addresses on each side of the network. So uh, the idea then is you can start up uh, a machine in the same uh, IP address range on Azure as you have can on premise, which then gives a total new uh, use case for uh, site recovery because then you don't have to run any scripts for site recovery. You start the machine in Azure with the total same IP address range. It's just moving it to Azure. It's also a great feature when you uh, go uh, go there and you want to migrate things to Azure and and also a great feature if you find out that your migration to Azure wasn't too successful, just bring it back and run it on-prem again. And then you have Azure monitoring and alerts. I think uh, uh, the Cosmos spoke about it. I'm sorry, I wasn't there at Cosmos talk. But uh, that's one of the big featured uh, features that uh, Azure Monitor is now available for Azure Stack HCI. Then the idea when you have Azure registered Azure Stack HCI clusters, you get a, from the Azure portal, you get a look, look on your on-premise clusters and also on the resources on your on-premise clusters, which gives you the possibility of monitoring, but also gives you multi-cluster monitoring and HCI insights there. And also, for instance, of all VMs, you see your VMs on your on-prem cluster in Microsoft Azure portal. I think was also one of the questions you you get and uh, with Arc then you get it as a resource into Azure and you get a, a, a view in, in Azure on all your resources which you have on your own system. Same for sure with other resources, it's storage uh, and a bit less on SDN and networks at the moment, but that sure will come when then is ready with ATC and uh, HUD. I think that will be then the next so that you can do configuration changes and have a, pain, a, a, a look from Azure to the networking of your on-premise part. And yeah, you should be aware that there is a difference between Azure Stack HCI and Windows Server in the meantime. Uh, Azure Stack HCI is the infrastructure and virtualization part. Server is for traditional and server, and the future of virtualization will be on Azure Stack HCI. So my recommendation is for everybody who runs Windows Server on-prem in bare metal at the moment, be look at Azure Stack HCI and uh, think about uh, uh, migrating to it. That's thank you, and now my shameless uh, marketing. We have a conference on the 29th of June with a whole stack, a whole track about again, about hybrid environments. Hopefully some interesting speakers like Carsten and DDA again, which uh, takes place in Linz in Austria. And we will do something rather uncommon for the moment because we, we just want to run an not even a hybrid, it will be an in-person only conference on the 29th of June 2022. So Carsten, and now uh, do we have some, you said you have a question which will take more time to answer. So I run through the rust so that I have still some minutes left. 
Yeah, I, I noticed it for an Austrian, you were very fast here. <laughs> Small yeah, that, joke. <laughs> that, uh, no, normally, we Austrians no, don't need to be fast because we just do solutions. We don't run around in regulations. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, the question uh, uh, was, I have a question about pricing. How do you persu persuade customers to go into a subscription Azure Stack HCI plus buy license, licenses, standard or data center? What are those features that, that you point out in favor of Azure Stack HCI instead of just data center plus S2D? Um, just to, we have two different use cases there. When we come to the small customers, they are in a low number of VMs. It's just uh, easy because it's cheaper. So my my really smallest customers where we have the last installations with 20, uh, 20 25 users, three VMs, uh, one of them Linux even, uh, four cores each, eight cores. So it's eighty dollars. It's eighty dollars, and they would need two data center licenses just do the calculation. So that the break even point is uh, for for SMB is. Uh, is somewhere by with two eight core clusters or something like that where where it and it depends on the number of virtual machines then so that there's no persuasion and just I, I don't like the word uh, to persuade somebody uh, the <laughs> idea is the idea i don't want to persuade the customers if you look at the whole hybrid integration is the whole azure arc integration at the features you have only an hci which at the moment is mainly stretch cluster but we have a roadmap which is there's a whole lot of things uh, azure stack hci only uh, we even had one customer who then took uh, hardware from another sponsor here perhaps from a guy which spoke before me. Uh, uh, they they really were totally into Azure Stack HCI. They said that's what they think that is the future, so they don't need even to be persuaded. It was the customer's decision because mm -hmm. they want to go into this digital transformation, have the hybrid uh, idea and have the whole hybrid thing. But at the end of the day, it should be a win-win situation. So I don't want to persuade the customer. It's just present what you can do. What's the advantages on hybrid? Does the customer think he has a benefit out of it? Is it worth the money? He will do it. Uh, if not, uh, he won't do it and he will go with data center and 2019. Uh, yeah, I have also I have also something that is better in Azure Stack HCI than in Storage Basis Direct. And that's the support. So Azure Stack HCI, you can get a really inexpensive, very good support uh, because it's ba it's it's part of Azure. You can get the support for your subscription, and that's let's face it, one hundred dollars a month for good support um, is a, a quite good offering. If you want the same amount of support with a storage basis direct cluster with Windows Server. You have to have uh, how it's called now a unity uh, contract for premium yeah. support and mm -hmm. that's that's maybe thirty thousand dollars plus a year so that's quite a difference one one thousand two hundred dollars uh, versus thirty thousand or even more so i think that's that's an advantage of uh, of azure stack hci if you ever need support of course then you have all the updates people are only comparing buying let's say Windows Server 2019, but then you are stuck with Windows Server 2019. If you if you want the new features that are that that are there in 2022, there are some that are not many, but there are some you have to have a, sub, uh, a software subscription. Nobody counts the price of that into the picture, right? Uh, that that for sure. That's what I meant. You have to do the commercial calculation correct. So you yes. have to really do a good cost of ownership calculation, including the updates or including, OK, I want to buy new in five years and then uh, do the whole maths against something which is uh, pay as you go or pay per use. Uh, and and also um, just to be honest, some of the customers really like this pay per use system much more from a from a CFO side. <laughs> Because that's something they can scale up and scale down as the as the need. Uh, 
So that's why also the more and more uh, try to get hardware on the same form. So yeah. that the, but the, that's that's a bit more complicated on the hardware side. Software, yeah. it's easier. But uh, I have another, I have another idea, uh, Helmut. Uh, I was just discussing that with uh, Manfred. Uh, Manfred, you can show both of us maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there is these Azure, uh, how it's called, uh, Windows Server 2022 uh, Data, Data Center, Center Azure, Azure Edition. Edition. We presume it's 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 not announced yet, but we think it's paid over the Azure subscription. So maybe you have your Azure Stack HCI and you also get your Windows Server VMs from Azure and you pay everything per use. So you yeah. don't have to add a data center or standard even to your Azure Stack HCI. Um, that, and if that, you want, that will be the logical next step at the yeah. end. So pay everything which also is premise on bare use. I've seen there's an additional question on the on the chat on the QA. Yeah. Have you heard about the certified solution? Have you heard about the certified solutions required by customers? Do you also have customers with an air gap scenario? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> just to be honest, we certify solutions. Yes, we. We heard, we on, we only have customers who require certified solutions. So, in, in detail, we run even if we do a, a PTO, a build to order, we run a, a private cloud simulator against. So we run it do a certification run against every single machine which leaves our house. So let me say case. something. Let me say something. Helmut is the go-to guy if you want to uh, certify an Azure Stack HCI or storage basis direct environment. That's not the case anymore. So everything is Azure Stack HCI, but you did it for multiple vendors. So yeah. you are the guy and air gapped Azure Stack HCI. You can't air gap. At least you, you told that in that session and that's uh, yeah. known at least every 30 days. It has to connect to Azure storage basis direct completely other story, but we're talking about Azure Stack HCI. But, but, but we have, Helmut, uh, so, sorry, we have partly air gap solutions with these two node clusters with the, which run around in vehicles. They mm -hmm. sometimes uh, only get a connect connection every 20 days or so, especially yeah. the guys running in Libya. There's, it's yeah. a bit strange. So, yeah, but they have to ha connect to Azure uh, eventually at, every 30 days. Yeah, at Another least every 30 that days is, for reconfiguration. Yeah. yeah. Another thing that I will use to uh, switch over to our next session, an advantage with Azure Stack HCI is also the good integration with Azure Arc and even the cluster integration. 